Some of you may know him from his recent articles in the Putinese called GNH, American Dream and Real Life. He's the second foreigner in the last few months to have voluntarily engaged in the discourse of gross national happiness by writing in the newspaper. Zoltan Volchak is the president of the Hungarian Bhutan Friendship Society and also runs the social profit maker to help companies engage with their communities in a manner that is responsible and innovative. And today, Sultan is my guest on Talking Matters. Tell me about your consultancy, the social profit maker. I mean, you particularly focus on social value. If you could also tell me what it means to have social value. Then. Yes. Uh, uh, first, when people hear about that, they... A bit, they're a bit confused, profit and social. How can you combine the two? Uh, basically, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm working with companies and non-for-profit organizations to make them more aware of their impact on society and the environment and make them work together so that they can achieve what I call more social profit mm -hmm. instead of just focusing on pure money profit, financial profit. So basically that's what I mean by social profit making. It's actually part of the whole discussion about responsibility of companies. And actually all of us in the society, vis-a-vis -vis the environment, vis-a-vis -vis the community, when we run a business, when we run a company, when we run a country, we should be aware of all the negative and positive impact we have on society and again on nature. You worked with Levi Strauss for uh, 12 years and you were working on the same field as well, corporate responsibility, creating social value. Was that, um, was it challenging for you or was there acceptance already at Levi Strauss so it was easier for you to introduce this responsibility? In a way it was easy because this company is a privately owned company which means that still the owner is a family. So you cannot, sh you cannot buy shares of Levi's. They are, not, they are not on the stock exchange. And this family, over decades, uh, paid a lot of attention to the impact of the company on society and environment. So in that sense, that was, a, that was an easy uh, kind of start. But when it comes to the practice, of course, it's great to have the concepts, you know, no child labor. That's for one of the most important uh, 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 principles. But when it, when it comes to practice, there's a lot of barrier. You know, these, the, the production, uh, uh, the supply chain of a company like Levi's is pretty big. It's across the globe. You have, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of suppliers. First of all, you have to make them understand about your values, what you want to achieve, what you want to avoid. But then you have to also help them to do that. And uh, when companies are driven by quality, delivery time, or cost, it's a kind of a hard argument when you meet with the manager to say, you know, there are other things to consider. And it takes a long time. And that's another kind of challenge because um, it takes sometimes a year, two, three, even five, to build up a community program, like a AIDS education program. But then, maybe one year after, two, two years after you started, the company decides to go to another country, which is more favorable, which is cheaper maybe. So it's an everyday kind of, not fight, but an everyday uh, challenge, I would say. And what I learned is how to turn the principles into the language of different levels of an organization from top to the middle to the employees so they understand and they can actually put in practice what we mean by social and environmental responsibility. You're here in Bhutan uh, volunteering and you also have a blog called Volunteering in Bhutan on blog post. Um, when you are mentoring entrepreneurs here then, is this the line of thought that you sort of guide them towards then or what is it that you tell them here? Uh, first of all, I really enjoy 
I uh, really enjoy volunteering here and, and working with companies. First of all, because uh, they are small, much smaller than Levi's, which means that they can apply things much more quickly. So that's, that's, uh, that's a good thing. Also, they are part of the community naturally. You know, they live in the community. They see the garbage, I'm just saying something, or they can see people in poverty. So in that sense, for them, it's easier to understand that they have a responsibility. I think what is, um, is kind of a challenge here or something to learn is how to do it. And, uh, and many people think that corporate social responsibility starts with giving money. And I think that's true. It starts, but it doesn't end there. You have to go a bit beyond that. And you have to look at how you actually run the company, how you treat your employees, how you actually consider the environmental impact of your organization, do you recycle or not. So sometimes it's very practical things. And um, I'm enjoying discussing these opportunities with, uh, with uh, em entrepreneurs uh, supported by the Loden Foundation and the new tech park. Mm -hmm. um, I'm enjoying that because I'm not here to help them or to advise them really. I'm here to engage them in a discussion about how we can actually run a company in a more responsible way. And you don't really have to be a really big um, organization or a company to actually be responsible. I mean, one specific example, and one entrepreneur who started uh, his business through the Loden Foundation is, of course, Dawa Dakpa from Shuvival. And you like to use him as uh, one of the um, good examples of uh, being responsible. Yes, I think it's, it, I, I'd like to highlight him, although he's a very humble man, and I, I don't think he's ag he's agree <laughs> he does agree with me when I'm, I'm highlighting him. But I, ha I think I have to, because, uh, uh, because Bhutan and other countries, they need such examples to follow. And yes, uh, Shoe Vival and uh, Help Shoe Bhutan is a great example because it's a new company, it's a small company, which is demonstrating that, yes, it can be done. We can actually do a profitable business, we can run a profitable business in a way that we also support the community and, in this case, recycle, which is excellent. On the other hand, I think without the examples of big companies, larger companies, national companies, and sometimes international companies, it's kind of hard to sell this idea to the small and medium size because they think, okay, why should I do if the big players are not doing too much? So I think it's, uh, you have to do it in different levels. And the last thing which is, I think, very critical is the government and the government policies. To create an environment where a business can feel comfortable doing something like that. And also a business can do it in a way that it can stay or actually became, become uh, profitable. Because of course you don't want to drop the profitability <laughs> out of the boat, you know? You, you, you cannot be uh, responsible mm -hmm. if your business go bankrupt. But then, I mean, you have uh, experienced yourself and seen case studies where profitability is not compromised just because uh, your corporation takes on responsibility to give back to society. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely you should not compromise profitability. On, on the other hand, uh, a lot of uh, things depends on the effectiveness you manage your business. That's another thing uh, I'm trying to discuss with uh, entrepreneurs here, how to become better in management, how to become more efficient. You know, sometimes it's very simple things, time management, emailing, don't pick up the phone every time it rings, you know, these kind of things. So once you are a more efficient, more cost efficient, I think you can afford much, you know, much more, much more easily to start giving to the community and to think about uh, the uh, whole responsibility you have vis-a-vis -vis the community.
This is uh, your second visit to Bhutan, but I mean you've seen, you've read a lot of stuff about Bhutan and most recently you've decided to engage in dialogue with uh, Bhutanese people as well as another foreigner about gross national happiness. And it's interesting because when you began the article, which uh, I mean two of them have come out already in the Bhutanese, mm -hmm. in the first one you begin by apologizing for being a chillip in inverted commas, and then yes. commenting on gross national happiness. But I mean, if you were uncomfortable about being an outsider and uh, talking about GNH, why did you go and write something about it then? That's a very good question. And I, I hesitated for um, long days before I wrote and submitted my article. And I checked with my friends in Bhutan and outside whether I should get engaged. Um, Sometimes you have to get your voice heard, I think. Uh, and I apologize because I have to, because I'm not a Bhutanese. And it has to be, first of all, a Bhutanese debate about the applications and uh, the practice of GNH. On the other hand, you like it or not, GNH has become a globally debated and discussed concept, basically. So it's on the what I call the global market of ideas. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's, it, it's scrutinized, it's debated, it's discussed, and in my view, for better. Because uh, once it's discussed, people can actually learn about the concept itself more, you know, they can learn more about it. Plus they can think about, wow, well, what does that mean in my life? What does that mean in my business? What does that mean in my city. How can we actually put this in practice? And also I had to um, um, write my thoughts because I think the proposals I, I actually saw in the article, in the original article by the American uh, teacher uh, professor, I, do, I just don't agree with the proposals. You know, it's, um, there are um, the insights, the criticism can be uh, justified, but if your proposals are not right, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, uh, you're just halfway. So, but but yeah. you also feel this because uh, you feel that Hungary, where you come from, and Bhutan share almost similar histories, the kind of transformation that Bhutan is going through. Even your country went through it at some point of time. And there was an ideal that most Hungarians were trying um, to reach, like the Bhutanese are at the moment. So you feel maybe, do you think that is where the empathy came from, that you needed to come in and also talk about how GNH can work? You're very right because when I was young, when I was 18, um, and I am celebrated, I was celebrating my uh, birthday with my friends, one of the gifts I got was a Big Mac from McDonald's. And it sounds ridiculous today, but for me at that moment, on that day, that was the American dream. And I actually constructed my Shangri-La at that time. I just realized, looking back, and my Shangri-La was the United States and the West in general. And I wanted to go there, I wanted to work there, I wanted to you know, in, enjoy it and, and see it. And, and I did. I was fortunate enough to work for Levi's, traveled around the world, and I saw myself what, what the difference between the American dream and the reality. And in all fairness, that's fair. I mean, it, there is nothing bad about that. There's a, there's always a gap between GNH and the practice, between American dream and the practice. But what, uh, what is interesting uh, for me in Bhutan is to see the different similar steps Hungary has gone through, uh, has taken uh, about 20 years ago when the country went through a similar, not similar but not the same transition you know, how the market evolved, how the businesses evolved, how society suddenly started struggling with issues like drug abuse, alcoholism, crime, and huge unemployment. And that was a kind of a shock to the society and kind of a wake up call because people realized again, what we had a dream, we had a dream about the West and we had a dream about a free market, democracy, and in fact, we have to wake up and we have to work hard to create our own dreams, our own proper dreams. 
instead of just taking the dreams and trying to apply them in our country. But that's hard work. In that sense, I was in agreement with the writer of the article because, yes, hard work is important. On the other hand, again, you have to be selective when it comes to different models and proposals coming from the West and kind of filtering it in a way that, yes, is it, does it, can we do it in, in Bhutan? Is it feasible in Bhutan? Is it good for us in the long run? And in that sense, I think it's critical how people in power, people in uh, important positions behave because people watching them, people always watching their leaders and how they behave, what sort of values they follow, and that's important. At least that's what I saw in Hungary. You're talking about the importance of dialogue. I mean, through our interview from the beginning till now, I sense this, um, that we need to communicate. There needs to be communication as well as dialogue to be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. Then is, is that why you decided that you wanted to set up the uh, found, the Hungarian Buddhist Friendship Society as well? It's a year old and one more month, I think, a year and one mm -hmm. month. So is it because of that, an exchange of ideas? Then you've organized some events already, although you're barely uh, just a year old. Yeah, definitely. I, when I came here again, because I already got my Shangri-La by the United States and I, I realized there is no Shangri-La, I did not create another Shangri-La <laughs> coming to Bhutan. I really wanted to see, first of all, uh, what I heard about GNH and I wanted to see it in practice. And also I wanted to see how the transition is going on and uh, particularly the businesses and the market. And um, after I, uh, I got back home to Europe, I said to myself, I have to keep in touch. Uh, I, I made a lot, of a lot of friends here. I, I love to be here and I still thought that we could do more. So I established with my friends, the, probably the newest uh, friendship society in Europe. Uh, we invited Dr. Karma Punzo and uh, his wife, who is behind the Loden Foundation to launch the society in Hungary. And uh, we actually organize events, but not about Bhutan, really. Bhutan is, um, we take it Bhutan as, a, as an opportunity to discuss different subjects. Uh, you know, it can be art, culture, but economics as well, uh, nature and nature preservation. Like next, next event is gonna be about uh, environmental impact and uh, the melting glaciers and the forest and etc. In, in Bhutan. So we take all these uh, subjects, we discuss it through the angle of Bhutan and then we look, it, uh, look at the applications in Hungary. And uh, it's very exciting because we are part of a network of friendship societies in Europe. And, uh, and, uh, and I think these societies are doing a great job in promoting Bhutan outside of Bhutan. Um, and I'm here again because I want to do a better job in endorsing Bhutan and I'd like to again not necessarily contributing to uh, a dream making but uh, I'd like to share information, uh, authentic information and, and, uh, and, uh, and experiences with other people in, in Europe. Your members are 25, I mean ever since your registration began in uh the middle of last year, that is. I mean, how do the people come forward to become members then? Have they traveled here already or they've heard about Bhutan and would like to see more of yeah. Bhutan? That's why they become members. It's actually, uh, we started recruiting members after we registered in uh, last, actually last June, a couple of months before, ago. Uh, we have a very diverse membership. You got a uh, professor of business ethics, you got a medical doctor interested in herbal medicines, traditional medicines. There are people, uh, students, environmentalists, uh, Buddhist teachers, because in Hungary we have a Buddhist university, which is uh, the only one in Europe subsidized by the state. So we got a very interesting group of people who, has, some of them have been here, but it's not very common for Hungarians to visit uh, to visit Bhutan. That's one of our objectives, to help them uh, get there. And uh, they, they're genuinely interested in this country. 
and, um, and in fact, the um, whole concept of our society is not to create a small group of isolation, but we are reaching out to other friendship societies like the Japanese, the Indian uh, universities, the Buddhist uh, uh, college or Buddhist university, and we always organize events together. Mm -hmm. And you should have been there last time when we, we, uh, we celebrated Losar. We invited two Bhutanese from Vienna, a couple forest engineers, mm -hmm. and the man is a great cook. So he helped us cook, and we, he, they, are also, they were talking about uh, the food in, in Bhutan, Losar, and, and all these things. And, uh, it took like five minutes, or the Dutch is gone. <laughs> <laughs> it was really a, really a success. <laughs> but so. is this not difficult for you? I mean, your own uh, personal pursuits like this, as well as your work as somebody who wants to create social value in the lives of uh, business people, as well as corporations, is there never any difficulty for you? There's an excellent book uh, about uh, people who uh, become, became successful. And the book says that it's never a one man, one woman show. It's never the person, an independent achiever. There's always behind a group of people, friends, sometimes foreigners who support, and the family. And that's the case for me. So I couldn't be here without my family, my wife, my, you know, my daughter, who are not, not hopefully suffering because I'm not there but also, uh, you know, the, my friends behind the Friendship Society. So only with their help, I can manage that. And, uh, and also, at the, at the, on, you know, on the other hand, when I'm discussing time management with small entrepreneurs, sometimes I realize that hmm, I can learn from myself <laughs> to switch off the phone, switch off the, you know, not done checking emails, not checking emails, that sort of thing. So, I think it's, um, um, it takes discipline and uh, when I uh, started learning more about Bhutan and getting engaged with Bhutan, that opened a lot of doors for me to new people, new things, and one of, one of the new things was actually Buddhism uh, in a way that uh, I already kind of flirted with Buddhism, I would say, when I was younger. It was always close to my heart. But um, since I am engaged with Bhutan, I'm learning uh, a lot and I'm trying to practice more and more. And one thing I'm, I'm practicing is, is uh, meditation and, uh, and I'm trying to uh, use the different techniques to be more concentrate, concentrate better, organize my, my life, my everyday uh, tasks better and that helps, I think. It's wonderful to know of your experiences with Bhutan and I'd like to thank you for coming on Talking Matters today. Thank you so Pleasure. much, Sultan. Thank you.